Hello and welcome to The Bad Spot and another video in my how-to series for new players and this one is one of the most requested pieces of content I've been asked for over the past year. It's a Combat 101. Combat in Iron Sworn and Iron Sworn Starforged is super intuitive and really fun and I find it hugely enjoyable to play. But the approach it takes can trip some new players up, especially if they are more used to other systems that perhaps take a more structured tactical approach to combat. So I thought it would be good to provide a basic overview of how it all works and then especially talk about how that might differ from other systems that you may have played. And accompanying this overview, you'll find not one, but two separate videos with specific combat examples from both the original Iron Spawn and Iron Spawn Starforged, and they both feature some very special guests. In this video, I will be using Starforged for all the examples, but please do take the time to check out the Iron Sworn combat example video because there are some very subtle differences, and in that video, I'll go over them. But before I get into that, please like this video, subscribe if you've not done so already, and click the little bell icon so you can be notified next time a video drops. Those things are really important in terms of supporting the channel and supporting what I do, and if you really want to take the next step in supporting what I do, then why not check out my brand new Patreon, where you can sign up for early access to all episodes, monthly bonus content, and also get your name on the screen like these lovely people. And you can find a link to all that in the description below. Anyway, that's enough shilling. Let's talk combat. Iron Sworn Starforged is a narrative-led, fiction-first game, and that approach extends to how the game deals with combat. Now, that's not particularly unusual these days, but some players might find the switch from games that take a more traditional structured approach to combat a little bit of a head scratcher. And what do I mean by that? What do I mean by structured combat? Well, in games like D&D and Pathfinder, they might be loose and free flowing outside of combat encounters, but once a combat encounter actually begins, these games become structured, and that structure usually means things like rolling to determine initiative, following a turn order, uh, tactical positioning where distances and weapon ranges are tracked, and that can mean often using, but not always, miniatures or tokens on a grid or a map, uh, hit points, uh, weapons that do varying degrees of damage or have varying effects. These are all things that are very common in a lot of role-playing games. And please, please, please don't get me wrong. It can be really fun to crunch your way through a combat encounter turn by turn. And I certainly have had a blast doing that in the past. But whilst that approach is very popular and certainly ubiquitous, it's not the only way to skin a cat. Iron Sworn is an evolution of the Powered by the Apocalypse system, or PBTA. If you are not familiar, PBTA is a narrative system named after a game called Apocalypse World that has since been implemented many times in games such as Dungeon World, Monster of the Week, Urban Shadows, Mask, City of Mist, Monster Hearts, Root, Thirsty Sword Lesbians, there is a whole bunch of them. Now, this system focuses on the fiction first and, broadly speaking, isn't structured at all. PBTA games take the form of a conversation between the players and the rules only kick in when something in the fiction that the players are creating triggers a mechanic known as a move. Now, I've been over what moves are in my How to Play overview, so if you're still not sure, go away, check that out and come back. Now. When combat occurs in a PBTA game, play doesn't shift into a structured, turn-based minigame. It continues being led by the fiction, it continues to be a conversation, and moves continue to be triggered. So there's no rolling for initiative, there's no turn order dictating who acts when, and no real limits on what or how many actions a character can take. There are only the parameters of the fiction and the limits of the imaginations of the players. And this can be a little confusing to get your head around if you come from one of those more traditional games. And it relies on the person running the game to keep that fiction moving in a fluid, dynamic, exciting way. And it takes a lot of practice. And it's because you don't have 
the structure to fall back on. You can't just turn to the next player in the order, ask them to roll their dice and move on to the next person after that. The reason that I love the PBTA approach so much is that you have this total creative freedom to play out the encounter in any way you want without the restrictions of weapon ranges, character actions, hit points and turn order. Now, I also totally accept that crunchy, turn-based tactical combat is what draws a lot of people to role-playing games in the first place, and that is absolutely 100% valid. It is immense fun getting a party together, tooling up with magic weapons and fighting monsters. Once again, don't get me wrong, traditional combat encounters can be great, but it's not the only way. So how do you approach a combat encounter when there is no structure? Well, imagine the best action scenes or fights in movies you can think of. Just run through all your favourites in your head. Now, the reason that these scenes are so memorable and so thrilling is because they use pacing and editing and staging to create tension and, as a result, drama. Now, when you think of those great scenes, you're probably not thinking of them playing out in turn order. You're probably not thinking of how many actions each of the characters has, or whether or not they can move an exact distance, or what range their weapons have. What those great action scenes do is follow the action, follow the characters in these extreme life-or-death situations in hostile environments, and builds the tension and drama by cutting between the characters and between their points of view and positions. There's no hang-ups on whose turn it is, or who has what hit points remaining. The action follows what's most relevant in the moment and reminds you what the stakes are, using every trick in the book to increase the tension and increase the excitement. And this is what PBTA Combat asks you to do. So when you're running combat in a PBTA game, you are essentially playing as the director. You are responsible for building this tension, responsible for cutting between these characters, pacing the action in such a way that makes it fluid and dynamic and it's also what can make it difficult and that's what takes practice to become comfortable with. It's a type of play that I really really love and with an open table with imaginative players it can be so much fun. And this brings us on to Starforged where this is also very much the approach. Now the game is designed to be played cooperatively in small groups or solo like I do. Now, you can play it with a GM, but it's a game very much designed from the ground up for solo or co-op play. So how on earth does that work? If you're being asked to play as the director of a scene, how can you do that if you're also one of the actors? How can players fight enemies that aren't being controlled by anyone? How can they frame the action if they don't know whose turn it is? How and when? Do you decide to cut away to build tension? Well, Starforged has a series of really clever mechanisms that make it all work. As usual, you start with the fiction. You envision what is happening, and if something happens in the fiction to start a combat, you simply switch to using the combat-specific set of moves. Let's have a look at an important one, and it is the very first one that you will make when things are about to go down. That move is Enter the Fray. Enter the Fray says... When you initiate combat or are forced into a fight, this is the trigger. If this happens in the fiction, this move triggers. It goes on to say, envision your objective and give it a rank. If the combat includes discrete challenges or phases, set an objective with a rank for each. So combat in Starforged is focused on objectives. Encounters aren't just about fighting enemies until they're dead. The conflict is just part of a bigger scene in which you have a specific objective. So your combat might be called something like fight your way out of the bar or shut down the shield generator or rescue the envoy from the pirate camp. Once you've worked out your objective, you need to determine the rank, which is how hard it's going to be. And we measure this difficulty in the same way as anything in Starforged with a progress track. These 10 boxes get filled in as we progress through a fight in much the way you do a journey or a relationship or a quest. They have a rank between troublesome and epic, and the rank dictates how long it will take you to fill up the track. And difficulty is fluid. In our example, we might have established that these untrained, disorganised pirates aren't all that dangerous in the grand scheme of things and make it troublesome. But we might be totally outnumbered by the pirates, so we could make it formidable. But whilst we may be outnumbered, what if we're bringing vastly superior firepower or skills to the party? That might bump it down to dangerous. So we have our objective and we have our rank. 
Let's read on. Then roll to see if you are in control. So it's giving us multiple ways to make the move depending on the fiction. And what does that mean? Well, let's continue with our example. Are we going to carefully prepare to ambush the camp? Well, that's going to be this rolling plus shadow. Are we just going to walk up to the camp entrance and throw down the gauntlet? Well, that's going to be rolling plus heart. Did we fail another move before this and have been caught unawares by a patrolling guard? Well, that's going to be rolling plus wits. You figure out what fits the fiction best and you make the move to determine whether or not you have control of the encounter. When your characters are in combat, their position is defined as being in one of two states. They're either in control of the situation and making proactive moves, or they do not have control over the situation and have to make reactive moves. This is called being in a bad spot. On a strong hit for Enter the Fray, you get to be both in control and get a sweet momentum boost. On a weak hit, you have to choose one or the other. On a miss, you're beginning the fight up against it. The enemy has the upper hand and you're in a bad spot. So now what? What do you do? Who goes first? What can the players do? Well, they can do anything you want. You simply continue to narrate. You continue with the fiction. If you're in control, what would your characters do? Would they pick a target and open fire, move into a better position to try and take them out quietly, or maybe ignore them completely and head towards the objective? And what if you're not in control? What if you're in a bad spot? What, what does the enemy do? You envision what's happening and you continue with the fiction. And whenever that fiction triggers the move, you reach for your dice and you roll. Well, let's continue with our example of the pirate camp. Let's say we're in control and we are up in an elevated position with our sniper rifles and we are going to pick a target. We decide to use this to our advantage and open fire. Well, that just triggered a move. That move is strike. Strike says, when you are in control and assault a foe at close quarters, roll plus iron. When you attack at distance, roll plus edge. So once again, you can see here is the trigger, here's the mechanical effect, and here is the new fictional framing. But what if you don't have control? How do you control the bad guys? How does that work? Well, NPCs don't have stat blocks in Starforged, although the book does include a brief bestiary of possible foes you might run into. And this broadly describes how dangerous they are and then lists some basic behaviours of things they might do. But you can easily apply this logic to any NPCs you make up yourself. So let's stay with our example of the pirate camp and let's say that we are in a bad spot this time. Uh, we took up a good elevated position with our sniper rifles but we were seen by a patrolling guard. And we know that these drift pirates here will shoot first and ask questions later. We have established in the fiction running up to this event that they are ruthless and they don't mess around when threatened. So let's say if we were seen, they would definitely sound the alarm, right? And they would probably open fire on us. Well, guess what? That's just triggered another move. And that move is react under fire. React Under Fire says, when you are in a bad spot and take action in a fight to avoid danger or overcome an obstacle, envision your approach and roll. And once again, you have multiple options depending on the fiction. Trigger, mechanical effect, new fictional framing. But this move isn't your only option. You don't have to try and avoid the incoming gunfire. You could just return fire. You could try and wrestle control of the situation back. You could make the move clash. Clash says, when you are in a bad spot and fight back against a foe at close quarters, roll plus iron. When you exchange fire at a distance, roll plus edge. The positioning of being in a bad spot rather than being in control, however, makes this much more of a dangerous move if you miss, which is totally appropriate for the situation. And the encounter continues like this with control of the situation flowing organically with the fiction. If you're playing co-op, then each of you have control independently of each other. One of you might be in a bad spot, the other might be in control. And it makes for really dynamic, interesting situations and play. And whilst there are only eight combat-specific moves, each one has various options depending on the fictional framing. So you have absolutely loads of flexibility. It's not just roll to hit over and over until your enemy is defeated. And there's nothing to suggest that any of these moves have lethal effects. A strike can represent gunfire, it can represent a swift right hook, or a starship unleashing its payload. It's very, very fluid, and you don't even have to actually defeat your enemy or even fight them at all using these rules. 
Remember, this system is objective based, so you can actually avoid fighting completely in a combat encounter. If you can do that and play out a combat encounter entirely by sneaking around or outmaneuvering or outwitting your opponent. So what do you do once your progress track is filled? Well, it's not over. You have to roll for it and you do so by making this move take decisive action. This is a progress move, and like all progress moves, you don't roll your action dice and add a stat, you are rolling your challenge dice against your progress. You can try and fill up as many boxes as you can to better your chances of success, or you might be forced to try and do it early and take your chances with the dice, but be aware that this can, and often does, backfire spectacularly. There's only really one thing left to talk about, and that is the battle move. Let's take a look. It says when you fight a battle and it happens in a blur, envision your objective, and roll. Now you make this move if you want to have a combat encounter but you perhaps want to have it play out in the abstract. You might make this move when you've got lots and lots of combatants and you want to perhaps zoom out and watch this from a bird's eye view. Or maybe you might make the move if the specifics of the combat aren't actually that important or if your session has already run over but this is an important conflict that you have to resolve before you will go home. Making this move boils down the entire combat everything I've been talking to you about into just one roll. Now I made this roll once when I was playing in a solo campaign and my character was leading a column of hundreds and hundreds of soldiers through the wilderness and in the night we were beset by a gang of roving raiders and I thought they would be better rather than kind of making lots and lots of moves and having to account for all these combatants that I would just boil it down to one roll I envisioned my character boldly leading these soldiers in a head-on charge and then rolled the dice. And then I narrated the outcome as a dynamic montage focusing on just the heroic moments. You might not make this move very much, uh, you might not even make it at all, but it is a very, very cool option if you want to swiftly resolve an inevitable combat in a short period of time. And that's it, I think. Like I said, if, if you want to see combat in action, then you can check out these two combat videos. We have a co-op Starforged example with Jenna Figures of the Ladies of D&D stream. And we also have a video where Steve Morrison of the Errant Adventures podcast takes us through a solo combat using the ever so slightly different combat rules from the original Iron Swarm. Please be sure to check those videos out. And if you've got any questions about combat or the system in general, then leave them in the comments below and I will try and answer them the best I can. I will be back next week where I believe the campaign will be finally making its return. So until then, it's farewell and safe 